I'm Chloe and I'm from uh, the Association of Mortgage Intermediaries. So before I jump right into the fascinating topic of consumer duty, I'd just like to say a bit about us. So uh, Amy, we are the trade body for the organisation. So it's our job to be your voice as the broker community. Uh, if, if we don't shout on your behalf in front of government, in front of regulators, nobody else will. So we are, we're very fortunate in that we do get listened to. Uh, we've managed to build up a very good reputation over the last decade, such that we have a, an audience with, uh, at the highest levels with the likes of DLUC, Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities. That's more of a mouthful than it used to be. Um, and uh, the, the Department for Business, Energy and Indus Industrial Strategy. Um, that's who we've been liaising with over the green agenda, so I'll move on to that later. And also Treasury, uh, we've got a meeting actually tomorrow with Treasury about the next phase for Helped By, and or now that Helped By is coming to an end, how do we help the next generation of first-time buyers? Obviously our biggest relationship is with the FCA, our regulator. Um, we feel that our relationship with the FCA is, is in a really strong place. It's probably more so than it has been in the last four or five years. Uh, a couple of years ago, the FCA had a big changeover of its senior leadership team. And since then, they've brought in all new people. And as we know, they've brought in this massive new regulatory agenda. And we've had it described to us as that the environment feels something of like a business startup. So everything's in flux, everything's still being formed. And that's on the one hand exciting, because it means that we get to be a part of that conversation to shape how things go forward. But it also means that it's absolutely crucial we have a seat at the table right now so that we can be part of the big decisions for the years to come. So as, uh, as it says on the, uh, the agenda, I'm going to be mostly talking about consumer duty with a bit on green towards the end. Um, and it's just going to be kind of a high level summary of what you need to be thinking about and getting in the right place to, to make a plan for this. So I think with consumer duty, it's very difficult for our sector because actually this isn't primarily aimed at us. We are a good sector. We have relatively low complaints volumes. We are by and large getting it right. And I know that probably the very fact that everybody's sitting in this room wanting to be a, keep abreast of the latest industry developments and be on the front foot with their businesses everyone in this room is part of that uh, cohort that's already doing the best practices. So a lot of people reading through consumer duty will think, well, we already do this stuff. So you've got to kind of pull off this slightly Orwellian feat of just keep doing everything you've always been doing, but at the same time undergo a complete mindset shift where you're, you're approaching things in an entirely new way. But that new way is the shift, the new consumer principle from towards delivering good outcomes and away from the focus on the processes that you follow to achieve those outcomes. And actually, delivering good outcomes is twofold. So you have to put the focus on the outcomes, but you also then have to check and say, did we actually deliver those? And how do we evidence that? And I think the evidence piece is the thing that is going to be the real challenge here for a lot of firms. Beneath that, we have sitting the three cross-cutting cross rules. So the first one, act in good faith. And this one may seem blindingly obvious, and again, it's something we already do, but when you mix in the evidence piece with that, it's how do you evidence that? Um, and I think a lot of this comes down to integrity. So whatever your customer proposition is, how are you delivering on that? The promise that, that of your pitch when a client comes through your door, is that promise fulfilled by the time they've completed the transaction and indeed five, 10 years down the line and they're a long-standing client for yours. The next one, avoid causing foreseeable harm. Now, this one's quite interesting because in the original wording in the, in the proposals, it actually said avoid foreseeable harm, which we felt was a bit too open, particularly from a a false point of view to interpretation and put too much onus on advisors to be able to kind of be miracle workers and just avoid all harm befalling their clients. So we've put causing in there to narrow that, that we're pleased to see they've put causing in there to narrow that scope, but we must also not be complacent because the foreseeable word is an interesting one here. Because if you're just 
an ordinary person going about your everyday life, you might think that an illness that stops you from working and paying your mortgage was an unforeseeable event. It's so unexpected. It's nobody, it's, you know, it's something that most people don't have to go through. But from an advice point of view, because we have a whole industry dedicated to mitigating that risk of uh, injury or illness causing you to no longer be able to work, pay the mortgage, if clients aren't remembering those protection conversations and you're not introducing that, the need for why, why you might want protection in the right way, then that's going to be seen potentially as a risk under consumer duty that you're not fully fulfilling that um, responsibility towards clients. Because if you haven't talked to them about it or if you've touched on it but they haven't really got it, they just think you're trying to upsell them for commission but you've not said about really what the risks are of not having protection, then that's where the, the, the kind of the risky place lies. So we think we do expect this to be a kind of a boost for the protection industry because it's about that wider advice piece and not just getting the best deal on the mortgage. And that kind of ties in with the third cross-cutting rule as well, which is enable and support customers to pursue their financial objectives. Um, I mean, I, as you, you've heard earlier, I do come from a, the more uh, wealth financial planning uh, background. So I think we're kind of, we're more... Uh, familiar or more used to this idea of you're almost crossing into the territory of helping clients just achieve their life goals and that you know this idea that financial goals are really just life goals that have a financial instrument in order to achieve that nobody really wants a mortgage they want the house or nobody wants a pension they want to retire comfortably so I think this this is difficult for people who are just in the mortgage space because your compliance people want you to stay in a box. They're going to, they don't want you to stray outside of your permissions and start kind of giving this more holistic advice. But what consumer duty is telling you is whilst you can't give advice on things you're not author authorized for, you still need to be taking into account the wider financial position of those clients and making that a part of your, your narrative and your story when you do your recommendations. So if you're recommending a tracker mortgage, are you looking at as well is that type of a client, does it make sense for that type of client to have a tracker mortgage? It, do they have a pension that's invested very aggressively? Do they like to have um, a stocks and shares ISA that is 100% in emerging equities, for example? That makes sense. Conversely, if you are recommending a long-term fix, if the riskiest thing that that client has ever, has ever had is premium bonds, then again, that is a story that makes sense. So you're still probably going to be making the same recommendations because you get a feel for this stuff when you're talking to clients you know how to do your jobs but it's more how you're framing that and how you're looking at the wider advice piece so moving on to the um to the outcomes now these i'll go into more detail on these uh later but those are products and services price and value consumer understanding and consumer support and these kind of constitute your end-to-end -end consumer journey so from first introduction to the transaction, initial transaction taking place through to how you service them in, over the years and develop that longer term relationship. So I think one of the key things that we're keen to stress to firms in having done our initial sort of scoping out of what this is and what's trying to achieve is that this is something that sits at firm level. So you're not going to be sitting down with clients and reopening conversations on fair value, rerunning your due diligence every time you source a mortgage. This is something that's going to be a one-off exercise, well, not a one-off, but a self-contained exercise that occurs at regular intervals, and it sort of sets the agenda for how you go about your business. So and I think, you know, that's where a lot of confusion has come in because this doesn't really supersede the, the MCOB uh, rules. The MCOB governs your day-to-day -day client relationships and how you conduct that business. Consumer duty sets the, the, the blueprint, if you like. One way you might want to think about it is consumer duty as a kind of a recipe book and MCOB as how your chefs, your advisors individually cook that recipe to perfection on each occasion. So it's about the end-to-end -end, uh, consumer proposition. Um, but also um, it builds on all of these things that, um, that we've been talking to you about uh, for many years now. And um, just going back to the, 
the kind of what this is with consumer duty. I think one of the, the, the difficulties will be for firms who, smaller firms who aren't within this sort of large corporate structure and they don't have um, a really widely set of established policies and procedures for doing things. Um, and I think it's sort of making sure that you don't, um, you know, Oh, sorry, I've, I've lost my thread of thought on that one. But um, I think I'm running out of time anyway, so I'll, I'll move on. But, um, oh, hello. There we go. I think there's some gremlins in the technology today. Um, so, yes, it bit, so I think another thing with consumer duty is why, is, why are we doing this? And um, we're, we're, unfortunately, we're, we're in an industry where things are still going wrong. There is still a minority that is ruining it for, uh, for the rest of us. And if we think about a very prominent example, we think about British Steel. And this was a situation where, at the time, everybody knew what the risks were. Everybody knew kind of uh, that this could spell trouble further down the line. But the FCA was unable to act. So even though we had all of these things in place, uh, they didn't have sufficient ammunition um, because people were ending up in these. It's not that they could come out and outright ban uh, defined benefit transfers because for a lot of people it made sense. But um, it was more about what was happening after the transfers were taking place. People were ending up in these very risky investments or outright scams or people were not receiving the ongoing support needed to be able to um, to be able to manage that transition from a defined benefit arrangement to a um, to something that's finite and going to run out. So we're left with a with an FCS, FSCS, who have to pick up the tab for this and find a polluter pays funding model in an environment where the polluters are coming and vanishing very uh, before anybody has a chance to do anything. So consumer duty is designed to be able to um, catch that before the, the harm happens and before you are, uh, you know, if, if they can go into a firm and if it's not compliant, it's much easier to shut them down because they're unable to prove that they're uh, achieving good outcomes. So yes, it is a bit of a guilty until proven innocent kind of mentality, um, but this is the new standard that is having to be set in order to root out the bad actors in our industry so we can all continue to serve clients and do our best for them and as I say, do what we're already doing well. So I think this covers things I've already said, but um, you know, my firm does this already, but the new rules and guidance are um, asking you to evidence it and monitor it to a level that is probably not what you are already doing. And if you read the firm guidance as well, there are, there are actually quite concrete examples as to how you can achieve that. Um, so I would direct you to that as a, as a good place to start. Now, looking at the four outcomes in more detail, um, we have with products and services. Now, I think this one is where we've started to think of this one as what if you had to go back to square one and redo your business plan? Because we're now looking at an environment with authorizations where the FCA used to be turning down one in 14 applications and they're now turning down one in five. And quite often the reason for that is because the business plan it doesn't stand up to scrutiny, it's not credible. And we know of some very competent people in the industry who, you know, they've worked at household names, they're really uh, incredible CVs, incredible experience, incredible market knowledge. They've been a year trying to get authorised and they still haven't been successful. And we think, we're thinking the reason for that is the ambition of what they're trying to do doesn't seem credible to the FCA. They've not been able to say where they're going to get their customers from, how they're going to service all of these different markets. So, um, you know, you've got, I think they're looking at standard resi, but also uh, impaired and lifetime and new build with two advisors. And there's just not really articulated well enough how they're going to achieve that for their customers. So that's where that kind of the mindset of products and services, if you had to get reauthorized today, if you had to make a redo your business plan, how would you articulate how you're going to marshal the products and services at your disposal to serve your market. Price and value, I think the, the, the key thing to remember on this one is that the FCA does not want to be a price regulator. We've, they've been very clear on this, that making a profit is fine. What isn't fine, 
or what's, what they're expecting to see here is consistency. So a charging structure that's well defined in advance for your standard cases, but you've also thought through those edge cases and who sits outside of that. Because what they don't want to see is the savvy customer who is able to negotiate getting a really good deal because they can haggle the price down and the, um, you know, the vulnerable customer who is uh, unable to, you know, who, who's less well knowledge, less knowledgeable is, is getting a worse price. So defining that in advance is okay in the sense that you can, um, you can, uh, you know, say that I, it requires more work, therefore there's more, um, you know, I, I, you know, need to be remunerated, but um, you, ha you can't just have that as a post hoc rationalization. It's got to be set there. Um, consumer understanding. Again, this is something that where the evidence piece is really going to come into play. So I think, um, how do you know your customers have understood what the implications are? And understanding is not the understanding as in the sense of they can go away and sit a CMAP exam after you've made your recommendation. It's do they understand what the implications are on their life, not only now, but in 10 years time. And I think one of the things that we've seen in the later life market with the consumer panel report that focused specifically on consumers who'd had bad experiences, bad outcomes, the prevailing thing was regret. And what is regret but delayed understanding? It's where you, it only becomes clear after it's too late what you've really entered into here. So just looking at not a low complaints values aren't enough to evidence this. You're going to want to be looking at those clients who didn't proceed with you. They didn't come back to you for repeat business. You know, why, how are they, um, what are their reasons? Because the threshold for making a complaint, complaint is actually quite high. So you're going to have to be doing that analysis piece um, to find out what customers really uh, experienced when they, went, when they came to you. And finally, um, customer support. That one is looking at, um, this is where the first cross-cutting rule really comes into play about integrity, uh, in, about um, acting in good faith. Because again, define, you have, if you define your cu customer proposition in advance, so long as you follow through on that, then that is okay. So if you're pitching yourself as a, the kind of broker that supports clients through the end-to-end -end proposition from kind of cradle to grave and you're the central point of contact for everything, and then you follow through on that, that is fine. But if you pitch yourself as, you know, we're gonna help you just get to the mortgage offer stage and then you're kind of, you can figure it out for yourself after there, that's also okay. What you don't wanna be doing is promising the former and delivering the latter. So one way to, my, to maybe think about it is you're not, consumer duty isn't about marking your own homework, but it's about setting your own homework for the FCA to mark. So in a way, you can actually set yourself up for success here, because as long as you get a very clear about what you're going to deliver, and then you deliver it, then you'll be in a good place. So I'm just keen that I'm, uh, I'm just very aware that I'm running out of time here. Um, so I'm going to skip over, um, I think I've discussed what's on these slides. Uh, the slides can be available after the talk as well. Um, and I'm, again, direct you to the non-handbook guidance. Um, and these key dates for your diary. So 31st of October is the plan of the plan where you have to do your gap analysis and cost allocation. 30th of April is where you're going to receive the information that you need from providers to be able to conduct your fair value assessments and, um, and, and complete that piece of work. Uh, 31st of July is where all new business has to be consumer duty compliant. And 31st of July is where you have to, to get the back book up to standard. So yes, I think just before I'll just on consumer duty, the thing to round off with is that the FCA has said that this is meant to be an iterative process. So they're not expecting um, this to be perfect first time. It's going to be messy. It's going to be a bit of a work in progress. And also they're listening. So they want to learn from us as an industry. They want to see how this lands and adapt how they regulate based on that. So. I think as long as you show that you're taking this seriously, you're not underestimating it, and you're having a good stab at it, um, then, then you'll be okay on this. So um, that's where I'll round off with consumer duty. Um, so the green agenda. Now, I think with the green agenda, um, the thing to think about is 
we're in a very tricky place at the moment because we're looking at a, um, a situation where um, we're heading into this energy crisis and the government has tried to take steps to, to mitigate the pain for, uh, for the lower income households and for all of us actually because of uh, this, uh, this the, the price and, and the shortage and the, uh, uh, that has been caused by various factors including the war in Ukraine. And that puts the government in a difficult position because they're caught between the three priorities, which is sustainability of supply, affordability of supply, and security of supply. And those latter two present a much more pressing and consequential problem for the government. So they're also showing signs of not abandoning the green agenda, but perhaps for the time being loosening their commitments so that they can address this immediate problem. Uh, we also have Jacob Rees-Mogg at the head of uh, Bayes, who is known to be something of a climate sceptic. Just a few days ago said, uh, we, Britain needs to get every cubic inch of gas out of the North Sea. So we're not abandoning change, but the government is, is not currently steering forward the agenda on this. But that doesn't mean that things aren't changing, because we already have targets in place for the private rented sector. Uh, landlords are already having to factor that into their business plans to get their properties up to C or above by 2025 uh, and beyond. And um, the, we've had the consultation for lenders to improve home energy uh, efficiency through uh, targeting them to increase their, their loan books, the, the, the energy efficiency averages of their loan books. So they've already been put on notice to do something. And the industry is taking this forward. So even though there's a sense of... I think the EPC system leads, leaves something to be desired. Uh, there's a lot of in inconsistency in the ratings in that you could have the same property getting three different ratings in the same day. And there's a bit of disagreement between government departments as to who should pay for this and who should take it forward. But the industry is acting without the government taking direction from the government. Green mortgages are something that, and they know that greenwashing is, is not gonna cut it. You know, Just giving a mortgage that's rated A or B giving people a discount on that, that's not going to be enough. They need to ensure that green mortgages are actually enabling people to go up the rating scale and make meaningful changes. So as brokers, I'm just going to leave you with the fact that uh, we're, we want to help you on this because we think brokers need to be part of this conversation. They need to be um, helping, you know, clients are going to be asking you about this and you need to be aware of all of these technologies, they're quite complex and they're, they're not easy to understand and where to start. Um, but, you know, you need to be... So uh, we're setting up a website called greenmortgageadvice.org.uk and that's going to have a 46-page broker handbook on it developed in collaboration with the Green Finance Institute. That's going to be a live document as developments emerge and it's going to be open for everybody to access so that you're in the best place to advise clients in this space. Because um, I think this transcends um, it, this transcends our industry and the interests of any one organisation. So we want to all work together to 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 tackle these this and as we work towards uh, net zero. So I'm very sorry for going very over time, but uh, I think that's all I have time for today. I hope that was a good mixture of uh, inspiration and fear. And uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your morning. <laughs>